Hey guys, what's going on? It's me, Laura, and welcome to my channel. Today, I would like to share with you my jury duty experience. So not only did I get a summons to go to jury duty, I was selected for the trial. So if you're interested in hearing my experience with being called for jury duty and being selected for the jury trial, then definitely stay tuned. Sometime around January 2022, I received a summons in the mail to attend jury duty. And I needed to be at the courthouse, the Frank Crowley Courthouse in Dallas on March 4th, 2022. Now, of note, I have never served on a jury or even been called for jury duty. So this was an all new experience for me. So on the day that they shared, March 4th, I arrived at the Frank Crowley Courthouse in downtown Dallas or right on the edge of downtown Dallas for jury duty. And um, once I got there, I had to wait in a line and then we went into what they call the central jury room. And before we sat down, they gave us a number. And it, my number said cafeteria six. So I was to report to the cafeteria and I was juror number six. So there were 101 people who were summoned for jury duty for this particular trial. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. We get to the cafeteria and we actually were delayed almost two hours. The judge told us at the end of the selection process that some people, there was some miscommunication and they didn't have a court reporter. So we had to wait for a court reporter to become available before we could start the selection process. So we waited, we were supposed to be there at eight o'clock. We didn't end up getting started with everything until after 1130. The judge came in and he shared with us, he said that the first 13 of us would be the jury. However, there may be bias and they had to go through the selection process. So me being juror number six, I knew that there was a high chance that I would be selected for the jury unless there was something that happened in the trial or that would potentially happen that I wouldn't feel as though I was able to would be able to give a um, bias. I wouldn't be able to be biased. Hope I said that right. So the judge kind of went through and he started asking people questions and um, if you have vacation planned um, for the dates of the trial, which were March the seventh and eighth. He asked people if they had vacation planned or if they were the primary caretakers for any children under the age of 12 or any adults. And so a lot of people were exempt because of that. They then went down and started asking people. They had a seating chart and knew who everyone was in each seat. They went through the seating chart and kind of randomly ask people about their bias. Now, the case that we were being selected for was the aggravated assault with a deadly weapon threat against a family member or family violence, or and family violence, excuse me. So the defendant was there as well, his him and his attorney, as well as the prosecutor uh, or the state's attorney. And so the state's attorney started asking people questions and then she got to me. She said, Miss Bryant, and um, you have to stand up and then um, pull your mask down so that they can hear you, the court reporter, so that she can hear you. Miss, she asked me, Miss Bryant, if these are the parameters for a person to be um, found guilty of aggravated assault with a deadly weapon threat, and the state proves all of these things, how would you find the defendant? And I said, I repeated what she said. I said, if the state proved that this person was knowingly or knowingly and intentionally committed this crime and all of the other parameters that justified a guilty verdict, I said, I would find the defendant guilty. 
And then she said, thank you. And I sat down. Um, a little bit later, the defense attorney called my name, asked me to stand up again. And he asked, would I like to live in a country where I wasn't able to be tried by a jury of my peers, but that the government could simply force a punishment on me, such as like a firing, firing arms at me or whatnot. And I said, no. And then I sat down. After that process went through with, you know, as many questions as they wanted to ask everyone, they asked all of us to leave out of that cafeteria area and wait outside for about 30 minutes. And then they would have the decision on who the jury was going to be. So we all went out and waited for them to come back and call us. And they called us like right at 30 minutes. We went back into the room and they again thanked us for our time for being there today, apologized for the delay and kind of gave us a rundown of what happened. And after that, he said, these 13 will be the jury. We'll have 12 and then an alternate. So they started calling names. He called name number one, number two, and he got to number three. And who did he choose? No one but me. So I was the third juror selected for this jury trial and I went off and stood to the side after which uh, everyone left and then they showed us where we needed to report. Um, so this was on a Friday and our trial was starting on Tuesday. So they showed us where we needed to report on Tuesday, what time we needed to be there and all that would happen. And so that was the first day of jury duty on a Friday. So we didn't get done until probably about 2.30, almost three o'clock. But again, our everything for our trial was a bit delayed because we didn't have a court reporter. So now it is March the 7th and it is now time for us to serve on the jury. Now, initially we knew that we knew the defendant's name, we knew the um, the victim's name, we didn't know their relationship, we didn't know the details of the case or anything. We just knew those basic things, what he was being charged with and that it was against a family member and the date that it took place. Now they said to us that the date it took place was on or about December 28th of 2020. So this man had been incarcerated since December 28th of 2020. And you know, in this state, I mean, you know, we're innocent until proven guilty. So the only way we were supposed to come up with a verdict of guilty or not guilty was with the facts of the case that were presented by the prosecution and the defense. We arrived on the 7th and like I said, there were 13 of us. It was a pretty diverse jury for the most part. Um, we had about, there were four African Americans or black people on the jury, two women and two men, but one of the women was the alternate. So ultimately she didn't get to have a, a say in the jury. She just was there in case somebody had to back out at the end or or felt like they couldn't make a decision on the verdict. Um, so when it was time for us to deliberate, she left. So there were three blacks on the jury, two men, one woman, me. There was one Asian woman. There were a couple, like two Hispanic men. And then the rest were white men and women. So like I said, <clears throat> it was a pretty diverse jury and the defendant was a black male. So we got there and the prosecution, uh, well, first we go into the jury waiting area. We're waiting in the jury room and then the bailiff comes and gets us and lets us, you know, we line up. She lets us know that the trial, the judge is ready for us and the trial is about to begin. We walk into the courtroom and I am at that point, the sixth juror who walks in. So I'm on the front row on the edge. The first time we go into the jury room, I mean, into the courtroom. The judge swears us in, so we have to raise our right hand. The judge says what she's gonna say, and we say, I do, and then, you know, we sit down. The prosecution begins by telling us that, oh, by the way, 
I can talk about this case now. I couldn't talk about the case until after the trial had ended. So we're good to go. I ain't gonna get in trouble or nothing like that. <laughs> so we get in the courtroom and then the prosecution begins and they begin um, telling us that on or about October, correction, on or about December the 28th, 2020, that the defendant made a threat to kill his mother with a weapon at her home. So I was like, whoa, we all just kind of assumed that the person was a spouse or a girlfriend, but it was his mama. And I was like, oh, no. Nah. So, <laughs> so we listened to the prosecution, kind of explain everything that happened and share with us that, you know, the details of what they were going to be um, presenting today to prove the defendant's guilt. So the first witness was the actual victim. It was the defendant's mother. And so she walks in and she's this like old, older lady, about 64 years old. So she was 62 at the time of this offense. And um, I mean, she was, you could tell she was a little disabled. And so that, that made me a little bit sad, you know, cause she kind of walked in there and that was just sad. Um, but she got up, the judge swore her in, and then the prosecution starts to ask her questions about what happened. The victim begins to tell us, the jury, that on December 28th, she shared that her son was homeless and that he had been back and forth at her house since Christmas, but that she lets him come over to take showers and to eat and things like that on occasion. As we got further along in the process, we learned that this defendant had some issues, I believe, with mental health. And so I believe that's the reason that he probably was homeless and that she didn't allow him to live with her, but allowed him to come over for showers and for food. There is definitely history in that family. They don't really share all of that with you. They just present the facts of what was going on right then. So she shared that he was there. He came in, he was there the night before and he left um, that night, the 28th, 7th at about midnight. And she and her husband wondered where he went, but knew he would come back. So he came back on the morning of the 28th. The victim shared that when he arrived, he said, I'm going to jail today. And then he started like, he went in the kitchen. She said, he start, He said, I'm going to jail today. And she said, quit talking that nonsense. You're not, you know, I don't want to hear all of that today. And he said, well, I am. She said, he went in the kitchen and proceeded to prepare him, uh, himself leftover chicken and rice that was in the refrigerator. And then she said, he started to tear stuff up. She said that, he started to, he flipped over a table in the living room, broke the glass that was on the table, it was a glass coffee table. She said he broke that. He started just throwing stuff all over the house. She said he went into the um, bedroom and picked up a big ashtray and threw it at the television, knocked the television over. The television was on a stand. He knocked it over, broke the television. And then she said that he went into the kitchen and got a knife and uh, rubbed his finger across the top of the knife and said, I should have killed you last time. And I was just kind of like, whoa. And she said, when he said that, I should have killed you last time and had the knife in his hand, that's when she called 911. She called the police. Um, the police came and they, we're talking to him. We were two officers there. We watched the body camera of the second officer on the scene. When the second officer came, there was already a first, an officer already there who was speaking to the defendant. The defendant had a bowl in his hand, which I am assuming was where the chicken and rice was. Um, he was outside of the apartment speaking to the first responding officer. The second responding officer went into the apartment and he began to speak to the victim. You could see on his body-worn camera, 
you could see the destruction in the apartment. Like clearly something had transpired. You could see the table flipped over. You could see what appeared, I thought it was dirt initially, but it was glass. The glass was black. So it was like black glass all over the floor. And then you could see the TV, the screen was flat down and then the officer raised it up and you could see that it was just totally destroyed. Um, you could hear the victim and see her in the video and she continued to say he has problems, he has problems, he has problems. You know, he said he was going to uh, kill me or he should have killed me. And that's a threat in the state of Texas, especially when you present a weapon. And so um, based on that information, the officer had enough to arrest the defendant. And then he went downstairs because that's where the defendant was at this point. Um, with the defendant and the responding officer, he shared with the defendant that he needed to put his hands behind his back um, because he was being arrested. And immediately, I mean like immediately, the man dropped the bowl of chicken and rice on the ground and put his hands behind his back. The officer had to remove the backpack that was on the defendant. Then uh, he put his hands behind his back again and he cuffed him. So there was no resistance or anything like that. The responding officer was also there and gave his account on the events that occurred that day. Once we heard all the information from the prosecuting attorney, from the defense attorney, they were able to, you know, go back and forth and ask additional questions. The only defense <laughs> that the defense, the only defense that they had was the defense attorney just shared. He said, well, when you eat chicken, you know, is it likely that you would have a knife to cut the chicken? So I was like, really? That's all you got? <laughs> is that all you got, sir? That was his only defense. And the defendant at times when his mother was talking, he kind of verbalized, you could hear him or you could see him kind of being animated and shaking his head. And you could kind of tell that he was laughing at certain points of that process and of the testimony. And it was just kind of different for all of us. So at this point it was time for lunch and the judge said that we could deliberate during lunch because we had heard all the information that we needed to hear. We could deliberate during lunch and then whenever we had found a verdict to let her know, let the bailiff know, and then she would let they would we would let her know. So we go back into the deliberation room, we all get our lunch, we sit around the table, we select a four person, and then we start talking about the case. We first before we started talking about the case, we first kind of went around and based on we read the the charge again and everybody gave their opinion on what their verdict was. There were some people who said, well, I need a little bit more information. So we read uh, through everything again. We looked at the pictures because they provided us photographs and we all talked about what happened, um, you know, what we heard. One of the interesting things is that a lot of, some of the people said they couldn't understand what was going on in the 911 tape. And of course, you know, your girl had to kind of help him out. So I was like, well, guys, my experience in 911 as a dispatcher kind of helps me have um, a little bit more understanding of what was happening in that call. Because it was a lot of voices and a lot of things going on. And I said, the person who was taking the call was also dispatching at the same time and you could hear that happening so you could hear the call taker or the dispatcher having a conversation with the defendant's uh, mother the victim you could hear that conversation as well as the conversation between the dispatcher and the responding officer so i had to help everybody to differentiate what was going on in that call who knew that I was gonna have to help do that. But nonetheless, <laughs> we talked about it, we deliberated for probably about 45 minutes. And then ultimately we found the defendant guilty of the charge that was presented on that day. After we gave the verdict in the courtroom, the judge thanked us for our service and shared that she wanted to speak with us afterwards. 
and then that the attorneys wanted to speak with us as well. So we went back into the jury room. The judge spoke with us and thanked us and said if we wanted to stay for sentencing that we could, but we did not have to. And then the attorneys just came and you know thanked us for our service or whatnot. So there were four of us that were really interested in hearing the outcome of the <laughs> trial, myself being included. So after we finished speaking with the attorneys, we went back into the courtroom where the, you know, the, the actually the victim went up and said she didn't want him to have to go to jail. She really started crying. She broke down. She said she was fearful that she would be deceased by the time he was able to get out. And she just really didn't want it to go down like that. She didn't even want to testify against him. Um, and then the responding officer he spoke again on some other incidents that occurred with that same defendant with a knife and him pulling out a knife and making threats to kill, um, making threats to kill the guards at a prison near where he lived. Just a lot. And we also learned in that time that the defendant had a prior conviction of kidnapping like back in the late 90s. So he had an extensive criminal history that we didn't know about, but that we learned at that time. And ultimately the judge sentenced him to 15 years in state penitentiary. So that was my experience with jury duty, actually getting the summons and then being selected for the jury. It wasn't too bad of a process. And I actually, it felt good to, you know, give or to do my civic duty. Um, even though I was annoyed a little bit because it was inconvenient for me with work and some other things that I had going on, I am thankful that I live in a country where I have that opportunity to sit in front of a jury of my peers rather than someone just saying, hey, this is what you did or this is what you didn't do. Um, of note, it's important to know that when the judge, I forgot to tell y'all this earlier in the video, but when the judge gave him the verdict, he just laughed. He just laughed. And then when she sentenced him, he just kind of just seemed very nonchalant. Like I couldn't see his face. I could just see his body language and his body language didn't change at all, so. Anyway, hope you guys enjoyed this video. I have some other videos that I'm going to be hoping to get out this week as kind of just talk about some things that's been going on with your girl. So stay tuned. But anyway, y'all have a wonderful day. Bye.